This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week, as well as vote on what book I read next. Hit like and subscribe, and enjoy. Let's jump into Chapter 3 of Dracula. Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door, peering out of every window that I could find. But after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. When I look back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly, as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life, and I began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing only, I am certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it, he would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself, and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived like a baby by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits. If the latter be so, I need and shall need all of my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut. I knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library. So I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there were no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door laying the table in that dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all of these menial offices, surely it is proof that there is no one else to do them. This gave me a fright, for if there is no one else in the castle, it must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for... If so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did, by only holding up his hand in silence? How was it that all the people at Bistritz and on the coach had terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix, of the garlic, of the wild rose, of the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix around my neck, for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It is odd that a thing which I have been taught to regard with disfavor, and as idolatrous should, in a time of loneliness and trouble, be of help. Is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself, or that it is a medium, a tangible help, in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort? Some time, if it may be, I must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all that I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight he may talk of himself if I turn the conversation that way. I must be very careful, however, not to awaken his suspicion. Midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvania history, 
he warmed to the subject wonderfully. In his speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them all. This he afterwards explained by saying that to a boyar the pride of his house and name is his own pride, that their glory is his glory, that their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house he always said we, and spoke almost in the plural like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all he said exactly as he said it, for to me it was most fascinating. It seemed to have in it a whole history of the country. He grew excited as he spoke and walked about the room, pulling his great white moustache and grasping anything on which he laid his hands as though he would crush it by main strength. One thing he said which I shall put down as nearly as I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as the lion fights for lordship. Here, in the whirlpool of European races, the Ulgric tribe bore down from Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Woden gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe. I and of Asia and Africa too, till the people thought that there were the wolves themselves who had come. Here too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame, till the dying people held that in their veins ran the blood of those old witches, who, expelled from Scythia, had mated with devils. Fools, fools, what devils or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in these veins? He held up his arms. Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race? That we were proud? That when the Magyar, the Lombard, the Avar, the Bolgar, or the Turk poured his thousands on our frontiers, we drove them back? Is it strange that when Arpad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland he found us here, when he reached the frontier, and when the Hungarian flood swept eastward, we were claimed as kindred by the victorious? To us for centuries was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkey land, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard. For as the Turks say, water sleeps, enemy is sleepless. Who more gladly than we throughout the four nations received the bloody sword, or at its warlike call flocked quicker to the standard of the king? When was redeemed that great shame of my nation? The shame of Kosovo when the flags of the Wallach and the Magyar went down beneath the crescent. Who was it but one of my own race, who as Vavoid he crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula indeed. Woe was it that his own unworthy brother, whom he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk, and brought the shame of slavery on them. Was it not this Dracula indeed? who inspired that other of his race, who in later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who when he was beaten back came again and again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. They said that he thought only of himself, what good are peasants without a leader? Where ends this war without a brain and a heart to conduct it? Again, when after the battle we threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of Dracula blood were amongst their leaders. For our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Young sir, 
the Dracula as their heart's blood, their brains and their swords, can boast a record that mushroom growths like the Habsburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonorable peace, and the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. This diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at a cockcrow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. Twelfth of May. Let me begin with facts. Bare, meagre facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences which will have to rest on my own observation or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions on legal matters and the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over the books, and simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters that I had been examining at the Lincoln's Inn, there was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence that knowledge may somehow or sometime be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction as only one could act at a time, and that a change would be certain to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand, and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend to, say, banking, and another to look after shipping, in case local help were needed in a place far from home of the banking solicitor. I asked him to explain more fully, so that I might not by any chance mislead him. So he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place at London. Good. Now, here, let me say frankly, lest you should think it strange that I have sought the services of one so far off from London instead of someone resident there, my motive was that no local interest might be served save my wish only, and as one of London residents might perhaps have some purpose of himself or friend to serve, I went thus afield to seek my agent whose labours should be only to my interest. Now, suppose I, who have much of affairs, wish to ship goods to Newcastle or Durham or Harwich or Dover, might it not be that it could with more ease be done by consigning to one in these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy but that we solicitors had a system of agency one for the other, so that local work could be done locally on instruction from any solicitor, so that the client simply placing himself in the hands of one man could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself, is it not so? Of course, I replied and such is often done by men of business who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by one person. Good, he said, and went on to ask about the means of making consignments and the forms to be gone through, and of all sorts of difficulties which might arise, but by forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor. 
for there was nothing he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified all as well as I could by the books available, he stood up and said, Have you written since your first letter to our friend Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not, that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then right now, my young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder, write to our friend and to any other and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish for me to stay so long? My heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much, nay. I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engage that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted, is it not so? What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him, not myself. And besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner, and that if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them but in a smooth and resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of notepaper and three envelopes, they were all of the thinnest foreign post, and looking at them, then at him, and noticing his quiet smile with the sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood as well as if he had spoken that I should be careful what I wrote, for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal notes now, but to write fully to Mr. Hawkins in secret and also to Mina, for to her I could write in shorthand which would puzzle the Count, if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet reading a book, whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring as he wrote them to some books on the table. Then he took up my two and placed them with his own and put by his writing materials, after which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for under the circumstances I felt I should protect myself in every way that I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number seven, the Crescent Whitby. Another to Herr Lutner, Varner, the third was to Coots and Co. London, and the fourth to Heron Klopstock and Bill Ruth Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed, and I was just about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back in my seat, having just had time to replace the letters as they had been, and to resume my book before the Count, holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room. He took up the letters on the table and stamped them carefully, and turning to me said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. 
At the door he turned and after a moment's pause said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend. Nay, let me warn you, with all seriousness. Should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories. There are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now or ever overcome you, or be like to do, then haste to your own chamber, or to these rooms, for your rest will then be safe. But if you be not careful in this respect, then... He finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he motioned with his hands as if he were washing them. I quite understood. My only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom and mystery, which seemed closing around me. Later, I endorse the last words written. But this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. I have placed the crucifix over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams and there it shall remain. When he left me I went to my room. After a little while not hearing any sound I came out and I went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. There was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse, inaccessible though as it was to me as compared with the narrow darkness of the courtyard. Looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed in prison. I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. I am beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me. It is destroying my nerve. I start at my own shadow. I am full of all sorts of horrible imaginings. God knows that there is ground for my terrible fear in this accursed place. I looked out over the beautiful expanse, bathed in a soft yellow moonlight, till it was almost as light as day. In the soft light the distant hills became melted and the shadows in the valleys and the gorges of velvety blackness. The mere beauty seemed to cheer me. There was peace and comfort in every breath that I drew. As I leaned from the window my eye was caught by something moving a story below me and somewhat to my left. Where I imagined from the order of the rooms the windows of the Count's own room would look out. The window at which I stood was tall and deep, stone mullioned, and though weather-worn it was still complete, but it was evidently many a day since the case had been there. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and his arms. In any case, I could not mistake the hands, which I had so many opportunities of studying. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner. But my feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over that dreadful abyss, face down, with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes, I thought it was some trick of the moonlight some weird effect of shadow, but I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, 
worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years, and thus by using every projection and inequality moved downwards with considerable speed, just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this, or what manner of creature is it in the semblance of a man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape for me. I am encompassed about with terrors that I dare not think of. Fifteenth of May Once more have I seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion, he moved downwards in a sidelong way, some hundred feet down and a good deal to the left. He vanished into some hole or window. When his head had disappeared, I leaned out to try and see more, but without avail. The distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight. I knew he had left the castle now, and thought to use the opportunity to explore more than I had dared to do as yet. I went back to the room, and, taking a lamp, I tried all the doors. They were all locked, as I had expected, and the locks were comparatively new. But when I went down the stone stairs to the hall where I had originally entered, I found that I could pull back the bolts easily enough, and unhook the great chains. But the door was locked, and the key was gone. That key must be found in the Count's room. I must watch should his door be unlocked, so that I may get it and escape. I went on to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages and to try the doors that opened from them. One or two small rooms near the hall were open, but there was nothing to see in them except old furniture, dusty with age and moth-eaten. At last, however, I found one door at the top of the stairway, which, though it seemed to be locked, gave a little under pressure. I tried it harder, and found that it was not really locked, but that the resistance came from the fact the hinges had fallen somewhat, and the heavy door rested on the floor. Here was an opportunity which I might not have again, so I exerted myself and with many efforts I forced it back so that I could enter. I was now in a wing of the castle further to the right than the rooms that I knew, and a story lower down. From the windows I could see the suite of rooms that lay along the south of the castle, the windows of the end room looking out west and south. On the latter side as well to the former there was a great precipice, the castle was built on the corner of a great rock, so that on the three sides it was quite impregnable. Great windows were placed here where sling or bow could not reach, and consequently light and comfort, impossible to a position which had to be guarded, were secured. To the west was a great valley, and then rising far away great jagged mountain fastnesses rising peak on peak, the sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn whose roots clung in cracks and crevices and crannies of the stone. The windows were curtainless and the yellow moonlight flooding in through diamond panes enabled one to see even colors, whilst it softened the wealth of dust which lay over all, and disguised in some measure the ravages of time and the moth. My lamp seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight, but I was glad to have it with me, for there was a dread loneliness in the place which chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble. Still it was better than living alone in the rooms which I had come to hate from the presence of the Count. After trying a little to school my nerves, I found a soft quietude come over me. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table, where in old times possibly some fair lady sat to pen, 
with much thought and many blushes her ill-spelt love letter, and writing in my diary in shorthand all that has happened since I closed it last. It is nineteenth century up to date with the vengeance and yet unless my senses deceive me, the old centuries had and have powers of their own which mere modernity cannot kill. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. Whilst I live on here there is but one thing to hope for, that I may not go mad, if indeed I be not mad already. If I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place. The Count is the least dreadful to me that to him alone I can look for safety, even though this can be only whilst I can serve his purpose. Great God, merciful God, let me be calm, for out of that way lies madness indeed. I begin to get new light on certain things which have puzzled me. Up to now, I never quite knew what Shakespeare meant when he made Hamlet say, My tablets, quick, my tablets, tis meat that I put it down. For now, feeling as though my own brain were unhinged, or as if the shock had come which must end in its undoing, I turn to my diary for repose. The habit of entering accurately must help to soothe me. The Count's mysterious warning frightened me at the time. It frightens me more now when I think of it, for in the future he has a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear to doubt what he may say. When I had written in my diary and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket, I felt sleepy. The Count's warnings came into my mind, but I took a pleasure in disobeying it. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I determined not to return tonight to the gloom-haunted rooms, but to sleep here where of old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk, away in the midst of remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place near the corner, so that as I lay I could look at the lovely view to the east and the south, and unthinking and uncaring for the dust I composed myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so, but I fear for all that followed was startlingly real. So real that now sitting here in the broad full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. The room was the same, unchanged in any way since I came into it. I could see along the floor in the brilliant moonlight my own footsteps marked where I had disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me were three young ladies. Ladies by their dress and manner. I thought at the time I must be dreaming when I saw them, for though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and looked at me for some time and whispered together. Two were dark and had had high, aquiline noses, like the Count. Great dark, piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with the great wavy masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. I seemed somehow to know her face, and to know it in connection with some dreamy fear, but I could not recollect at the moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy. 
some longing and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain, but it is the truth. They whispered together and all three laughed. Such a silvery musical laugh. But as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips, it was like the intolerable tingling sweetness of water glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair-haired girl shook her head coquettishly. The other two urged her on. One said, Go on. You are first. We shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The other added, He is young, strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out from under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me, till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey-sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice. But with a bitter, underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive. As she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal, so I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped her white, sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed to fasten on my throat. She paused. I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and I could feel the hot breath on my neck. The skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle approaches nearer, nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat, the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count, and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. My eyes opened involuntarily and I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and with a giant's power draw it back. The blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth champing with rage, the fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count, never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even to the demons of the pit, his eyes were blazing. The red light in them was lurid, as if the flames of hell fire blazed behind them. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were hard like drawn wires. The thick eyebrows that met over the nose seemed to be a heaving bar of white-hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him, and motioned to the others as though he were beating them back. The same imperious gesture that I had seen used on the wolves in a voice which, though low and almost in a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and ring around the room, he said, How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all, this man belongs to me. 
Beware how you meddle with him, or you'll have to deal with me. The fair girl, with a laugh, turned to answer him. You yourself never loved. You never love. On this the other women joined, and such a mirthless, hard, soulless laughter rang through the room that it almost made me faint to hear it. It seemed like the pleasure of fiends. Then the Count turned, after looking at my face attentively, and said in a soft whisper, Yes, I too can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past, is it not so? Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go, I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing tonight? said one of them with a low laugh as she pointed to the bag which had been thrown upon the floor, and which moved as though there were some living thing within it. For answer he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and a low wail, as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round whilst I was aghast with horror, but as I looked they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag. There was no door near them. They could not have passed me without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of moonlight and pass out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down, unconscious. Chapter 4 Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued I awoke in my own bed, if it be that I had not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were certain small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which was not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it the last thing before bed. These things are no proof, for they may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and from some cause or another I had certainly been much upset. I must watch for proof. Of one thing I am glad. If it was that the Count carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his task, for my pockets are intact. I am sure this diary would have been a mystery to him, which he would not have brooked. He would have taken or destroyed it. As I look around this room, although it has been, to me, so full of fear, it is now sort of a sanctuary, for nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are, waiting to suck my blood. 18th of May I have been down to look at that room again in daylight, for I must know the truth. When I got to the doorway at the top of the stairs, I found it closed. It had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered. I could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot, but the door is fastened from the inside. I fear it was no dream, and must act on this surmise. 19th of May. I am surely in the toils. Last night the Count asked me in the suavest tones to write three letters, one saying that my work here was nearly done, and that I should start for home within a few days, another that I was starting on the next morning from the time of the letter, and a third that I had left the castle and arrived at Bistritz. I would fain have rebelled, but felt that in the present state of things it would be madness to quarrel openly with the Count, whilst I am absolutely in his power. 
and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion, to arouse his anger. He knows that I know too much, and that I must not live lest I be dangerous to him. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may occur which will give me a chance to escape. I saw in his eyes something of that gathering wrath which is manifest when he hurled that fair woman from him. He explained to me that posts were few and uncertain, that my writing now would ensure ease of mind to my friends. He assured me with so much impressiveness that he would countermand the later letters, which would be held over at Bistritz until due time, in case chance would admit of my prolonging my stay, that to oppose him would have been to create new suspicion. I therefore pretended to fall in with his views, and asked him what dates I should put on the letters. He calculated a minute and then said, The first should be June twelfth, the second June nineteen, and the third June twenty-nine. I know now the span of my life. God help me. Twenty-eighth of May. There is a chance of escape, or at any rate of being able to send word home. A band of gypsies have come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard. I have notes of them in my book. They are peculiar to this part of the world, though allied to ordinary gypsies all over. There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania, who are almost outside all law. They attach themselves as a rule to some great noble, and call themselves by his name. They are fearless and without religion, save superstition and they talk only their own varieties of the Romany tongue. I shall write some letters home, and shall try to get to have them posted. I have already spoken them through my window to begin acquaintanceship. They took their hats off and made obeisance and many signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. I have written the letters... Mina's is in shorthand, and I simply ask Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. To her I have explained my situation, but without the horrors which I may only surmise. It would shock and frighten her to death were I to expose my heart to her. Should the letters not carry, then the Count shall not yet know my secret, or the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters... I threw them through the bars of my window with a gold piece, and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed, and then put them in his cap. I could do no more. I stole back to the study and began to read. The Count has come. He sat down beside me and said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters, the Suscani has given me these, of which, though I know not whence they come, I shall, of course, take care, see. He must have looked at it. One is from you, to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other, here he caught sight of strange symbols as he opened the envelope. The dark look came into his face, and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed, so it cannot matter to us. And he calmly held letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp until they were consumed. He went on. The letter to Hawkins, that I shall, of course, send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not cover it again? He held out the letter to me, and with a courteous bow handed me a clean envelope. I could only redirect it and hand it to him in silence. 
When he went out of the room, I could hear the key turn softly. A minute later, I went over and tried it, and the door was locked. When, an hour or two after, the Count came quietly into the room, his coming awakened me. I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner. Seeing that I had been sleeping, he said, So, my friend, you are tired. Get to bed. There is the shortest rest. I may not have the pleasure to talk tonight. There are many labors to me, but you will sleep, I pray. I passed to my room and went to bed. Strange to say, I slept without dreaming. Despair has its own calms. 31st of May This morning, when I woke, I thought I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But again, a surprise. Again, a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone. And with it, all my notes, my memoranda relating to railways and travel, my letter of credit, in fact, all that might be useful to me were I once outside this castle. I sat and pondered a while, and then some thought occurred to me. I searched the portamento in the wardrobe where I had placed my clothes. The suit in which I had travelled was gone, and also my overcoat and rug. I could find no trace of them anywhere. This looked like some new scheme of villainy. 17th of June This morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cudgelling my brains, I heard, without a cracking of whips and pounding and scalping of horses' feet, up the rocky path beyond the courtyard. With joy, I hurried to the window and saw drive into the yard two great later wagons each drawn by eight sturdy horses, and at the end of each pair a Slovak, with his wide hat and great nail-studded belt, dirty sheepskin and high boots. They had also their long staves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall. I thought that way might be opened again. Again a shock. My door was fastened on the outside. I ran to the window and cried to them. They looked up at me stupidly and pointed. But just then the hetman of the Siskani came out. Seeing them pointing to my window said something at which they laughed. Henceforth no effort of mine, no piteous cry or agonized entreaty would make them even look at me. They resolutely turned away. The later wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope. These were evidently empty by the ease with which the Slovaks handled them, by their resonance at which they were roughly moved. When they were all unloaded and packed in a great heap in one corner of the yard, the Slovaks were given some money by the Sisgani. Spitting on it for luck, they lazily went each to their horse's head. Shortly afterwards, I heard the cracking of their whips die away in the distance. 24th of June, before morning. Last night, the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair and looked out the window, which opened south. I thought I would watch for the Count, for there is something going on. The Sisgani are quartered somewhere in the castle, doing work of some kind. I know it. For now, and then I hear a faraway muffled sound, as of mattock and spade. Whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour, when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully. 
and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me that he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst travelling here. Slung over his shoulder was the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too. This, then, is his new scheme of evil. He will allow others to see me, as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in towns or villages posting my letters, and that any wickedness which he may do shall, by the local people, be attributed to me. It makes me rage to think that this can go on, whilst I am shut up here a veritable prisoner, but without that protection of the law, which is even a criminal's right and consolation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time I sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice that there were some quaint little specks floating in the rays of moonlight. They were like the tiniest grains of dust. They whirled round and gathered in clusters, in a nebulous sort of way. I watched them with a sense of soothing, a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure in a more comfortable position, so I could enjoy more fully the aerial gamboling. Something made me start up. A low, piteous howling of dogs somewhere far down in the valley, hidden from my sight. Louder it seemed to ring in my ears. The floating motes of dust would take new shapes to the sound as they danced in the moonlight. I felt myself struggling to awake. To some cool of my instincts, my very soul was struggling. My half-remembered sensibilities were striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotized. Quicker and quicker danced the dust. The moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me, into the mass of gloom beyond. More and more they gathered till they seemed to take dim phantom shapes. And then I started, broad awake and in full possession of my senses, and ran screaming from the place. The phantom shapes which were becoming gradually materialized from the moonbeams were those of the three ghostly women to whom I was doomed. I fled and felt somewhat safer in my own room, where there was no moonlight and where the lamp was burning brightly. As I sat I heard a sound in the courtyard, the agonized cry of a woman I rushed to the window and, throwing it up, peered out between the bars. There, indeed, was a woman with disheveled hair, holding her hands over her heart as one distressed with running. She was leaning against a corner of the gateway. When she saw my face at the window, she threw herself forward and shouted in a voice laden with menace, Monster! Give me my child. She threw herself on her knees, and raising up her hands cried the same words and tones which wrung my heart. She tore her hair and beat her breast, and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally she threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear her naked hands beating against the door. Somewhere high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Before many minutes had passed, a pack of them poured like a pent-up dam when liberated through the wide entrance into the courtyard. 
There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long they streamed away, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. What shall I do? What can I do? How can I escape from this dreadful thing of night and gloom and fear? 25th of June, morning. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and how dear to his heart and eye the morning can be. When the sun grew so high this morning that it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove from the ark had lighted there. My fear fell from me as if it had been a vaporous garment which dissolved in warmth. I must take action of some sort, whilst the courage of the day is upon me. Last night, one of my post-dated letters went to post, the first of that fatal series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from this earth. Let me not think of it. Action. It has always been at night time that I have been molested and threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake? That he may be awake whilst they sleep? If I could only get into his room, but there is no possible way, the door is always locked. There is no way for me. Yes, there is a way, if one dares to take it. Where his body has gone, why may not another body go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should I not imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst, it can be only death. And a man's death is not a calf's. The dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Mina. If I fail, goodbye, my faithful friend, second father. Goodbye, all. And last of all, Mina. Same day. Later, I have made the effort, and God helping me, I have come back safely to this room. I must put down every detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh, straight to the window on the south side. At once I got outside on the narrow ledge of stone which runs around the building. The stones are big and roughly cut. The mortar has, by process of time, been washed away between them. I took off my boots and ventured out on the desperate way. I looked down, once, so as to make sure that a sudden glimpse of the awful depth would not overcome me. But after that I kept my eyes away from it. I knew pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window and I made for it as well as I could, having regard to the opportunity available. I did not feel dizzy. I suppose I was too excited. The time seemed ridiculously short, and I found myself standing on the window sill, trying to raise the sash. I was filled with agitation, however, when I bent down, and slid feet foremost in through the window. I looked around for the Count, but with surprise and gladness I made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished with odd things which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something the same style as that in the south rooms, and covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock, and I could not find it anywhere. 
The only thing that I found was a great heap of gold in one corner. Gold of all kinds. Roman, British, Austrian, Hungarian, Greek and Turkish money, covered with a film of dust, as though it had lain long in the ground. None of it that I noticed was less than three hundred years old. There were also chains and ornaments, some jeweled, but all of them old and stained. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. I tried it. Since I could not find the key of the room or the key of the outer door, which was the main object of my search, I must make further examination, or all of my efforts would be in vain. It was open, and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down. I descended, minding carefully where I went, for the stairs were dark, being only lit by a loophole in masonry. At the bottom was a dark, tunnel-like passage, through which came a deathly, sickly odour. The odour of old earth and newly turned. As I went through the passage, the smell grew closer, heavier. At last I pulled open a heavy door which stood ajar, and found myself in an old, ruined chapel which had evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken, and in two places were steps leading to vaults, but the ground had recently been dug over, and the earth placed in great wooden boxes, manifestly those which had been brought by the Slovaks. There was nobody about. I made search for any further outlet, but there was none. I went over every inch of the ground so as not to lose a chance. I went down even into the vaults, where the dim light struggled. To do so was a dread to my soul. Into two of these I went and saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third I made a discovery. There. In one of the great boxes, of which there were fifty in all, on a pile of newly dug earth, lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep, I could not say which. The eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death, and the cheeks had the warmth of life through their pallor, lips as red as ever but there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I bent over him and tried to find a sign of life, but in vain. He could not have lain there for long. The earthy smell it would have passed away in a few hours. By the side of the box was its cover, pierced with holes here and there, I thought he might have the keys on him, but when I went to search I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead though they were, such a look of hate. Unconscious of me or my presence, I fled from that place, leaving the Count's room by the window. I crawled up again on the castle wall, regaining my room. I threw myself panting upon the bed and tried to think. 29th of June. Today is the date of my last letter. The Count has taken steps to prove it was genuine, for again I saw him leave the castle by the same window, in my clothes. As he went down the wall lizard fashion, I wished I had a gun or some lethal weapon, that I might destroy him. But I fear no weapon wrought alone, by man's hand would have any effect. I dared not wait to see him return. I feared to see those weird sisters. I came back to the library and read till I fell asleep. 
I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me as grimly as a man can look, and he said, Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. You return to your beautiful England, I to some work which may have such an end that we may never meet. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow I shall not be here. All shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come to the Sisgani, who have some labors of their own here, and also come some Slovaks. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you. I shall bear you to Borgo Pass, to meet the diligence from Bukovina to Bistritz. But I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. I suspected him, and determined to test his sincerity. Sincerity, it seems like a profanation of the word to write it in connection with such a monster. So I asked him, point blank, Why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on the mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled, such a soft, smooth, diabolical smile. I knew there was some trick behind the smoothness. And your baggage? I do not care about it. I can send for it sometime. The Count stood up, and said with a sweet courtesy which made me rub my eyes, it seemed so real. You English have a saying which is close to my heart. Its spirit is that which rules our boyars. Welcome the coming. Speed the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Sad am I at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it. Come. With a stately gravity, he, with the lamp, preceded me down the stairs and along a hall. Suddenly he stopped. Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the rising of his hand, like the music of a great orchestra seeming to leap under the baton of the conductor. After a pause of a moment, he proceeded, in his stately way, to the door and drew back the ponderous bolts, unhooked the heavy chains, and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment, I saw it was unlocked. Suspiciously, I looked all around, but I could see no key. As the door began to open, the howling of the wolves without grew louder, angrier, their red jaws with chumping teeth, their blunt clawed feet as they leaped. They came in through the opening door. I knew then that to struggle at this moment against the Count was useless, with such allies as these at his command. I could do nothing. The door continued slowly to open. Only the Count's body stood in the gap. Suddenly it struck me that this might be the moment and means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, at my own instigation. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea, great enough for the Count, and as a last chance I cried out, Shut the door. I, I shall wait till morning. I covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment. With one sweep of his powerful arm, the Count threw the door shut. The great bolts clanged and echoed through the hall as they shot back into their places. In silence, we returned to the library. After a minute or two, I went to my own room. The last I saw of Count Dracula was 
is kissing his hand to me, a red light of triumph in his eyes, and a smile that Judas in hell may be proud of. When I was in my room and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it and I softly listened. Unless my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back to your own place. The time is not yet come. Wait. Have patience. Tonight is mine. Tomorrow night is yours. There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh and ran away. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. It is then so near the end. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Lord help me and those to whom I am dear. 30th of June, morning. These may be the last words that I ever write in this diary. I slept till just before the dawn. When I woke, I threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death came, he should find me ready. At last I felt that subtle change in the air, and I knew that morning had come. Then came the welcome cockcrow, and I felt that I was safe. With a glad heart, I opened my door and I ran down the hall. I saw the door was unlocked, and now escape was before me. With hands that trembled with eagerness, I unhooked the chains and drew back the massive bolts. But the door would not move. Despair seized me. I pulled and pulled at the door and I shook it till massive as it was it rattled in its casement. I could see the bolt shot. It had been locked after I left the Count. A wild desire took me to obtain the key at any risk. I determined, then and there, to scale the wall again and gain the Count's room. He might kill me, but death now seemed happier choice between two evils. Without a pause, I rushed up to the east window and I scrambled down the wall into the Count's room. It was empty, but that was as I expected. I could not see a key anywhere, but the heap of gold remained. I went through the door in the corner and down the winding stair, along the dark passage to the old chapel. I knew now well enough where to find the monster that I sought. The great box was in the same place, close against the wall, but the lid was laid on it, not fastened down, the nails ready in their places to be hammered home. I knew I must reach the body for the key, so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall and I saw something which filled my very soul with horror. There lay the Count, but looking as if his youth had been half renewed. The white hair and moustache were changed to a dark iron grey. The cheeks were fuller. The white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were the gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and neck. Even the deep burning eyes seemed set amongst swollen flesh. The lids and pouches underneath were bloated. It seemed as if the whole awful creature were gorged with blood. He lay like a filthy leech, exhausted with repletion. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him. Every sense in me revolted at that contact, but I had to search or I was lost. 
the coming night might see my own body a banquet in a similar way to those horrible three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. I stopped and looked at the Count. A mocking smile on his bloated face which seemed to drive me mad. This was the being that I was helping to transfer to London, where, perhaps for centuries to come, he might, amongst its teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood, and create a new and ever-widening circle of semi-demons to batten on the helpless. The very thought drove me mad. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon at hand. I seized a shovel which the workmen had been using to fill the cases. Lifting it high, I struck with the edge downward at his hateful face. But as I did, the head turned, and the eyes fell full upon me with a blaze of basilisk horror. The sight seemed to paralyze me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face, merely making a deep gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, and as I pulled it away, the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over again, and hid the horrid thing from my sight. The last glimpse that I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice, which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I thought and thought what should be my next move. My brain seemed on fire. I waited, with a despairing feeling growing over me. As I waited, I heard in the distance a gypsy song sung by merry voices coming closer. Through their song, the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips, the Siskani and the Slovaks of whom the Count had spoken were coming. With a last look around and at the box which contained the vile body, I ran from the place and I gained to the Count's room. Determined to rush out at the moment the door should be opened, with strained ears I listened, and heard downstairs the grinding of a key in the great lock, the falling back of a heavy door. There must have been some other means of entry, or someone had a key for one of the locked doors. Then there came the sound of many feet, tramping and dying away, in some passage which sent up a clanging echo. I turned to run down again towards the vault, where I might find this new entrance, but at that moment there seemed to come a violent puff of wind, and the door to the winding stair blew to, with a shock that set the dust from the lintels flying. When I ran to push it open, I found that it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner. The net of doom was closing around me more closely. As I write, there is in the passage below a sound of many tramping feet, the crash of weights being set down heavily, doubtless the boxes with their freight of earth. There is a sound of hammering, the box being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy feet tramping again along the hall, with many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut, and the chains rattle, the grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdraw. Another door opens and shuts, and I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. Hark, in the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips, the chorus of the Sizgani as they pass into the distance. I am alone in the castle with those awful women.
Mina is a woman, and there is naught in common. They are devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall farther than I have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. I may find a way from this dreadful place, and then a way for home. Away to the quickest and nearest train, away from this cursed spot, from this cursed land, where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At least God's mercy is better than that of these monsters. The precipice is steep and high. At its foot a man may sleep as a man. Goodbye all. Mina. And that is the end of the chapter and where we close the book on this episode of Down to Sleep.